So um, now we're going to have our presenters speak on the three questions. Do you all remember the three questions? Should I repeat them? <laughs> so the first one, how does Hawaii's history inform the path to Hawaiian independence? The second question, what do you envision as the path for Hawaiian independence? And the third question, what are your ideas for a possible governance model or next steps? So um, first to speak will be um, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Willie Kauai. Um, Willie actually was an uh, instructor here, and now he's helping Native Hawaiian Student Services up at UH Manoa. We miss him here, but um, he's still very active in the system, so it's nice to have um, somebody who's devoted their life, you know, helping all the students today. And let's see, what else can I read? His 2014 dissertation in political science is entitled The Color of Nationality, Continuity and Discontinuities of Citizenship in Hawaii. Here's Willie Kauai. Thank you. Um, mahalo nui for having me. Uh, mahalo Kahele and uh, your team in Hawaiian Studies for for putting this on. Um, mahalo to the students of uh, Introduction to the Hawaiian Kingdom. Um, um, I think this is uh, uh, very much a homecoming for me. My, my education um, in higher ed started here at Kopiolani uh, Community College in 1998. I'm originally from the island of Maui. Um, I, I graduated from public school um, in 1998. Um, with a very limited knowledge of any of this kind of history that, that's now being uh, uncovered today. Um, I, I, I grew up um, in a country Maui. Uh, my, my dad was a um, Hawaiian cowboy from Ulupalakua. Um, uh, like myself and the rest of his uh, genealogy on the Hawaiian side, um, they also had very limited knowledge about any of this information. Um, when I came to KCC in 1998, I um, barely made it out of my first semester. Um, went into um, probationary status. Um, and luckily, um, stumbled upon a professor here by the name of Dr. Hutton. Is, is, is Professor Hutton still here teaching with us? Um, one of the first people, I think, to, um, to really uh, teach me one of the most important things about uh, education, and, and that was really how to, how to think critically. Um, that, that launched me, I think, into wanting to know a little bit more about myself, wanting to know a little bit more about my family, um, and of course the history that comes with that. Um, when I transferred to UH Manoa in 2001, um, there, there wasn't very much places, even on that campus at the time, in which you could um, uh, go to learn more about our history. Right? Um, in my work that I do in Native Hawaiian Student Services, uh, we provide uh, financial and academic support for, for all 3,000 Native Hawaiians that attend UH Manoa. Um, um, as of 2016, and right now, that's the most uh, Native Hawaiians that uh, uh, that campus at UH Manoa has ever seen, 3,000. When you put that in context, right, the, the UH system, UH Manoa in particular, has been, has been open for almost 100 years, or more than 100 years now, right, since 1906. And we're only at 15% of the population at UH Manoa, right, the system's only research one institution, right, the research intensive um, school, we're only 15%. Um, when you look at the faculty as well too, faculty at UH Manoa comprise less than, less than 4% of the entire UH Manoa campus um, is Hawaiian. Um, when I showed up at UH Manoa in 2001, those numbers were much less than they are today closer to about 1,200 uh, um, Native Hawaiians um, in the general um, student body population. And the faculty at that time was less than 1%. Uh, 
Native Hawaiian. That I think gives you a good indication of kind of the, the, the systemic barriers and structures that Hawaiians had to deal with when it came to higher education, right? Hawaiians were, were, were systematically being denied access to higher education and just education in general. And that has a direct correlation to the occupation of Hawaii. Um, but when I showed, showed up there in 2001, there wasn't, there wasn't much of this research kind of unfolding. Um, I, I was lucky enough to, to study under Dr. Kanalu Young, um, who was a professor of Hawaiian studies at UH Manoa. Um, uh, unfortunately, he passed away in 2008. But he was one of the, the pioneers, I would say, in bringing this discourse of occupation, in bringing this, this, this idea of the Hawaiian kingdom still existing today, he was one of the first to um, begin to institutionalize it. Um, today, um, when we push forward almost 15 years later since I first got there at UH Manoa, there's a lot, there's a lot more happening. Um, there's a lot more uh, classes in which that you can take throughout Manoa in which this information is being disseminated. There's classes in the law school, there's classes in political science, there's classes in history, um, there's classes in ethnic studies, uh, um, Hawaiian studies, in which this idea of Hawaii being occupied, this analysis of the Hawaiian kingdom, uh, the focus of, of understanding our history in the 19th century is starting to, to come about. Now with that being said, I would, I would also say, I would definitely also say that um, there hasn't yet been an institution or a department at UH Manoa that has fully taken on the responsibility of figuring out these questions. Yeah? These three questions that you guys pose to us today are very important, but they need much more than a panel discussion. They need much more than just a class. They need a whole entire research institute and unit that's dedicated to it. You know, even with all, even with all the, 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 new, the new research that's, that's coming out, right? Um, for example, my dissertation on, on citizenship in the Hawaiian Kingdom. Um, when, you do, when you do a dissertation, when you do a thesis project, a research project of this magnitude, you have to do a literature review. You know? One of the questions you have to ask yourself is, okay, what other research is out there on this topic of citizenship in the Hawaiian Kingdom. And it's close to zero. You know? there's, there's never been a book written about Hawaiian citizenship in the Hawaiian Kingdom. There's been about two articles written on the topic of Hawaiian citizenship in the Hawaiian Kingdom. When you go to any other country in the world, take, let's say, America, the United States has thousands of books and thousands of articles on the topic of American citizenship and how it evolved. Hawaiian Kingdom has zero. Yeah. My dissertation is, is, is merely, I think, uh, um, a, a, very, a very, very small start in, in how much more research needs to be developed just in that. Um, so with that being said, you know what I mean, there's, uh, I think there needs to be pressure put on the University of Hawaii Manoa to institutionalize right, a place in which this kind of information, this kind of discourse can be produced. Because to be honest, Kapi'olani Community College and Windward Community College are the, two, are the only two institutions in the UH system that offers a class called Introduction to the Hawaiian Kingdom. Yeah. Awesome, but also very revealing of how much needs to be done, right? Why, why is it only KCC and why is it only WCC in which offers this class, Intro to the Hawaiian Kingdom, right? Um, one place, and I hope, I hope um, Professor Chang can speak to this, is one place where this research should be brought in is, is at the law school. Yeah? But when you think about the kind of information, the kind of power that this, that this discourse has, you run into a problem when trying to teach it at the law school, right? You cannot, you cannot sell American law in an occupied country. Yeah. That's very hard to sell. Yeah. And so you're gonna run up against a lot of challenges. Same thing with any other department across 
UH Manoa, right? There's, there's a lot of politics at stake with this kind of information. The idea of Hawaii being occupied throws a wrench in a lot of different things that are happening. Yeah. Um, so I just wanna, um, I think, congratulate KCC and WCC for taking that step and providing a class for this, right? Because like the students had said earlier, this information is, is, um, is groundbreaking, right? And it's, it becomes very motivating um, as a student uh, to get into this kind of research. And I can definitely attest to that. I walked out of Maui High with a 1.8. I almost, I almost dropped out of KCC in my freshman year. Um, but then stumbled upon some research that I found was interesting and all of a sudden have a PhD and I'm now the director of Native Hawaiian Student Services. And <laughs> when I come to this campus, it, I mean that I, I definitely have my reality check uh, that, I, that, I started, that I started here. You know? Um, um, I think, so to get a little bit, uh, I think to address a lot of these questions, um, particularly the one, that, the, uh, the first one, how does history inform the path of Hawaiian independence? I would say history is the most important um, aspect. It's the most important tool when we're trying to figure out the many of questions that we have today. Because there was a time in the 19th century, right, when Hawaii was independent, when it operated on its own, right, on its own country. And remember, this is at a time during, during the midst of European imperialism in the Pacific, right, where America, Spain, France, Great Britain, you name it, they're in these waters. Yeah? These are, very, these are very threatening times in the 19th century when you're a small little brown country trying to find your place in the world. So to think about how they were able to survive, not only, not only survive, but somewhat thrive in the 19th century amidst European imperialism is huge and very informative for us today. Right? The Hawaiian Kingdom is the first non-European nation in the world to be recognized as an independent state. It's the first... Um, Pacific Island nation to do the same as well, too. Now, when you think about what that means, right, the Hawaiian Kingdom was one of the forerunners, was one of the forerunners in figuring out how to take advantage of an international legal system, how to become a part of this so-called family of nations. Now, that's, that's very monumental um, on a number of stages. My... Um, my particular research, and when we talk about this, this question of how does history inform the path to Hawaiian independence, my research looked at the evolution of Hawaiian citizenship. One of the questions that I was posed with, with one of the, the, the places where my research ended, or was headed to, was asking the question, if Hawaii's been occupied for the last 120 something years, uh, then who comprises the Hawaiian national population today? Right? In the case of deoccupation, who would the Hawaiian citizens be? Who would the Hawaiian nationals be? In order for me to even get to that question, I needed to do an in-depth analysis of the 19th century. How did citizenship work in the Hawaiian kingdom in the 19th century? When you look at, when you look at how citizenship operated, say in comparison to the United States, the United States has a very ugly track record or history when it comes to citizenship laws. Uh, from the very inception of the US Constitution until like 1955, one of the prerequisites to be an American citizen was that you had to be white. Uh, you had to be white. Now that definition of white changes throughout American history, but from the very inception of the US Constitution, until 1950, I forgot what the act is called, one of the prerequisites was to be white. You know? And US citizenship afforded you rights, right? the opportunity to vote, civil rights. Um, now when you compare that, 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 that history, that framing of American citizenship to Hawaiian citizenship, it's very different. The Hawaiian citizen, uh, the Hawaiian legislature as early as 1950, 1845, excuse me, 
is passing citizenship laws that are racially inclusive. This is happening 20 years before the American Civil War even takes place. And this is happening about 120 years before the American Civil Rights happens, where people of color in 1845 were being afforded rights, protections, securities, the right to vote. Yeah. Um, one of the, the examples that I like to use in this, this contrast is the story of Anthony Allen, right? He's the first, considered one of the first black men to come to um, Hawaii. He is a slave in the American South, escapes the grips of slavery, finds his way to the shores of Hawaii, naturalizes, and becomes a Hawaiian subject. Yeah. Very, I think, important contrast to see. Anthony Allen um, is also, um, if you ever get a trivia question of who is the first person to open up a resort in Waikiki, it's Anthony Allen. Anthony Allen owns six beachfront acres in Waikiki. As a Hawaiian national, as a Hawaiian subject, as a former slave, right? So you can kind of see the, uh, he's, he's experiencing upward mobility, social mobility in this society called the Hawaiian Kingdom. Very, very progressive, right? Citizenship, an, an analysis of citizenship gives us some insight to that, to how progressive this society was in comparison to other um, countries at the time, such as the United States. In order to uh, acquire Hawaiian citizenship in the Hawaiian Kingdom, um, the legislature passed, passed laws um, saying that anybody born within the soil of the Hawaiian Kingdom, within the territory of the Hawaiian Kingdom, automatically possessed Hawaiian citizenship, automatically um, um, had the right to vote. Um, the other uh, um, criteria to acquire Hawaiian citizenship was through parentage, right? If, you're, if your parents were a Hawaiian national, a Hawaiian citizen, then you also acquired Hawaiian citizenship as well too. And the one, um, the last criteria, the last general criteria was, was through naturalization. Yeah. Um, this, just this history is so very important for us to, to, to know today, right? Because it informs how we understand uh, the decisions that we make today. Um, another, um, I think, important Example is, is the study of Betsy Stockton, right? considered also a former slave, uh, considered uh, the f one of the first black women to come to Hawaii. She doesn't naturalize. Um, however, she becomes a school teacher. Uh, she opens up the Stockton Institute where she um, taught Hawaiian women and children. Yeah. That, that institute later becomes Lahaina Luna. Uh, again, you can see a person of color coming to the Hawaiian Kingdom and experiencing social mobility. Now the question I would pose to you is, what was happening? Why, why were those kinds of laws being passed? Why were, why, were, why were people of color being afforded rights? Who's making the laws, right? The majority of the Hawaiian legislature at that time or throughout the 19th century up until 1887, are people of color as well. It's the Aboriginal population. You know? um, when you look at when you look at the Chinese experience in Hawaii, I think another very important um, um, history to understand, especially for purposes um, of citizenship, you know, we there are a lot of books written about the Chinese experience uh, when it comes to contract labor, the Chinese experience in Hawaii when it comes to uh, their experience in the fields. The one place that I would argue that needs a lot more research is those Chinese that walked out of the cane fields when their contracts were finished and naturalized, gained all the rights and privileges therein with Hawaiian citizenship, and again, experienced upward mobility. By the time the 1890s come around, the Chinese own the most businesses in Hawaii. They're at the center of the economic hub 
in Hawaii. There aren't, other, there aren't many other places in the world that were that welcoming, that were that accepting of Chinese or even people of color for that matter. Um, these citizenship rights evolve throughout the 19th century, right? For almost, for almost 40 years, um, constitutional amendments are made to citizenship. What always stays intact is that political and racial inclusion. You know? The moment in which you see the most drastic changes happen to Hawaiian citizenship is in 1887. You know? What happens in 1887? Bayonet Constitution, right? That's, that's the, the single event that drastically changes Hawaiian citizenship. You know? One of the clauses that you see in that article, right, the Bayonet Constitution is forced upon Kalakaua. Um, it's, it's being imposed by uh, a, a very small group of um, Hawaiian nationals that are white um, who are trying to uh, bring, bring the Hawaiian kingdom to a political and social system that mirrors the United States. Right? That also happens through citizenship. One of the things that you see within the Bayonet Constitution is the complete exclusion of Asians. You know, this is in 1887. In 1882, U.S. Congress passes the Asian Exclusion Act, right, which denies uh, certain rights and privileges to incoming Chinese that are going to the United States. Those that are um, um, forwarding the Bayonet Constitution almost adopt the same policy. They exclude the Asian population. Now these are Japanese, uh, uh, these are uh, people of Japanese ethnic descent that are Hawaiian nationals. These are people of Chinese ethnic descent that are also Hawaiian nationals that have experienced social mobility in the Hawaiian kingdom that were once given the right to vote and in 1887 are completely stripped of those rights. You know? um, the Aboriginal population is also um, stripped of a lot of rights as a result of 80, as a result of 1887 as well. What's important about 1887 is not just the analysis of citizenship, but one of the places that I think is um, also in need of much more research and also has, uh, I think, uh, the great ability to inform our understanding of who we are today, is the interethnic alliances that take place when the Bayonet Constitution goes down. You know, what you see is the Aboriginal population coming together with the Chinese population and the Japanese population to push back against this burgeoning or, or, or incoming ideas of, of, of white supremacy. You know, there's a great newspaper article that, uh, that comes out 1889 um, where there is a, um, a rally that takes place down in Honolulu um, trying to um, get rid of the Bayonet Constitution, trying to restore um, the old constitution that existed in 1887. Uh, there's a rally that takes place in Honolulu. There's about 400 people attend this rally. And at that time, it's a lot of people in Honolulu. You know? um, we don't really see those numbers, those kind of numbers today even. Or maybe today we do, but not too long ago we didn't. What's interesting about this, this particular rally is that the four, the, the four speakers that are there are um, Kei Katsura, who is a Japanese, uh, who's of Japanese descent, he's a Hawaiian national, and he's an attorney. The other speaker is Si Monting, he's a Chinese businessman. And the other speaker is Joseph Poi Poi, a Hawaiian attorney. These three people, a Chinese, a Japanese, and an Aboriginal under the banner of Hawaiian nationality are fighting against this kind of incoming uh, um, system to transform Hawaiian society. Yeah. So there was moments, there was a lot of moments in our history in which we came together. Yeah. Not just the Aboriginal population, but the multi-ethnic society that compose the national population. Yeah. It's very important today when when 
when we're trying to figure out the question of citizenship today, right? Or even just the general question of sovereignty. It's not just for the Aboriginal population to carry on their own shoulders by themselves, right? Um, <clears throat> you see very much the same thing that takes place after 1887, even during 1893, multi-ethnic alliances are happening. Uh, 1898, with um, the illegal annexation of the United States, same thing. Multi-ethnic alliances are happening under the banner of Hawaiian nationality. Uh, um, um, okay, I gotta start wrapping this up. Um, Hawaiian citizenship for sure is, is just one small aspect that's deserving, I would argue, of about 100 more books until we finally get an answer to a lot of these questions that we have today. Yeah. But when you're, talking about who, when you're talking about what takes place as a result of the illegal occupation, right? That occupation is what fully, this, the occupation that we have here, right? The occupation that begins in 1898 is what fully injects right, American racial ideologies into every single institution that we have today, right? It's forcing us, it's forcing us today to get into some very divisive arguments when it comes to who is a Hawaiian today, right? That idea of blood quantum, it's not our invention. It didn't exist in the 19th century. It was created by the United States for strategic purpose to disenfranchise certain people, right? Namely Native Americans. That ideology, that ideology of race gets fully injected. And for the last 120 years, every single institution that we have amongst us, right, has, for the most part, put out various kinds of American racial ideology. You know? um, I think when we, when we talk about next steps or models, Right. Um, one of the things that is very important to understand is that almost the entire infrastructure that we have today in, in, in Hawaii society today, from the Department of Education, from the police department, the fire department, the public health care system, these are not American inventions. These institutions did not show up when the occupation began in 1898. These institutions were born in the Hawaiian Kingdom. So when we talk about so when we talk about different models, um, the one model that we have to get better accustomed to is the one that existed in the 19th century. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> these this this infrastructure that we have around us, in many ways, in simple terms, if the occupation took pl place would need a change of administration. Yeah. Um, when, my, when I answered the question in my dissertation, who comprises the Hawaiian national population today? Um, <clears throat> the, the short story of that is anybody who can trace their, their, their ancestry, uh, their, uh, their ancestry to a Hawaiian national, um, Anybody who can trace their, their ancestry to a Hawaiian national that was um, in Hawaii before the occupation began in 1898, and it gets a little technical, I won't go into it, would be considered a Hawaiian national today. Yeah. Um, based on some percentage projections that I had, um, when you include the entire Aboriginal population into that Hawaiian citizenship category, and you take the 15% of uh, multi-ethnic Hawaiian nationals that were living in 1898, you come to a number in and around 600,000. So there are currently roughly 600,000 Hawaiian nationals that are currently living in the world today. One of the biggest problems that we face just with that number is that half of that population lives in the country of the occupier in the United States. In many ways, in many ways it could be their choice, but in many ways it's not, right? 
there is a system that got put in place in these islands that, disin that, that systematically disenfranchised, particularly the Aboriginal population, which always comprised the majority of the Hawaiian national population. Right? And one easy way to see that, and I mentioned that earlier, is education, schooling. Right? We're talking about a country in which the entire national population was one of the most literate in the world. Right? We go from being one of the most literate countries and people in the world to one of the most illiterate, to one of the most imprisoned, to one of the most, you name it, where that. That doesn't happen because Hawaiians are lazy. That happens because there is a system that got put in place, a system that had a lot of force and a lot of power that drove us to the bottom of the barrel. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, another, that's another system, that's another, that system of, of disenfranchisement that takes place in the occupation, I would argue, is another very important um, uh, place in which research needs to be done, right? You look at, I mean, we're talking, and it's out there in the newspapers. There's a 1907 article that talks about how the territorial government is going to change the school system, right? How the focus of... Uh, um, the education that's given to children is going to endorse the occupation, essentially. Right? Our understanding of the 19th century, our understanding of the, the, the accomplishments that our ancestors had were completely wiped away, right? completely erased. Um, so that being said, I, I, I again would like to congratulate Kapiolani Community College for taking taking that step to offer a class called the Introduction to the Hawaiian Kingdom. Um, I would also, I'd also like to encourage the rest of the University of Hawaii system, um, in, in, including Manoa, um, including um, other research institutions that we have, to also dedicate or institutionalize some of this research within those departments. Because yeah. again, like how I said when I started this presentation, these are very important questions that have to be answered, but they're not going to be done through a panel discussion or even a dissertation or even one book. It's going to need a dedicated research institute. Yeah. Mahalo. <laughs>